Hey, thanks so much for joining us again, Reaching the Next Generation. I am Chip Bennett, joined with Del Coulter here today. We're so glad that uh, you're here, but just want to say to all of you all that are watching, we have a number of ways that you can join the community. You can like YouTube, uh, we have Instagram, Facebook, all of the social media. Please make sure that you like and subscribe to those things if you would like to get more information on Reaching the Next Generation. So Del, when we originally started this podcast, videocast, the, the idea was that I felt as a pastor, I, you know, um, God had been just really gracious to me. Um, the church has grown. We've been able to see a, a, a lot of things, but I know that that's not the normal experience that pastors have. Mm. And so what I wanted to do is start a channel that would resource pastors, Christians, leaders that are struggling in that context of how do I reach the next generation? One of the things I say often as a pastor is that God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. And effectively, if we don't reach the next generation, we're one generation from extinction as a church. Now, I don't fundamentally believe that the church is going to go extinct, but I think you understand the, the thinking behind that. So what I wanted to do is have a channel that resource pastors. We, we have classes on homiletics, on how to better deliver sermons. Mm. We have stuff on apologetics for pastors and leaders that can answer the tough questions. Um, we have a systematic theology class to help people understand a little bit more of a robust idea of you know, theology um, and, and many other avenues for people to grab and take and to, and, and to use. And so what I'd love to do today, and this is something that I, the podcast is all about, is bringing in people that are not necessarily pastors, right. not necessarily leaders, um, although we do bring in pastors and leaders. Um, we bring in apologists. We bring in all kinds of people. That, that just give different perspectives on their particular opinions on how the church and Christians and leaders and pastors can best reach the next generation. Now, I know that you're a historical theologian, a church historian, and many people may think, well, how in the world does that intersect with reaching the next generation? Mm. But that's not true because you're teaching people right now. You're, you're training leaders to go out and to do ministry. And I guess the first question that I would ask you, and it's a question I ask most people, is, and again, your opinion, your thoughts, um, I'd love to hear them as a, as a professor. What do you think the American church, I can't speak to churches across the sea, sure. the American church, it appears, based on what we see, um, that the American church is in decline attendance-wise. That, that, that for the first time, and again, stats are stats, and they can be manipulated, but for the first time, it looked as if that, less than 50% of the people in America attend religious services, which is the first time since I've been alive, probably the first time since this country's even been a, a country that that's happened. Why is that happening? And what can the church do to reach that next generation? And any thoughts you have, and again, I know it's coming from, from a professor, it's not coming from a pastor, but just anything that you could give to someone who's listening right now as a, as a professor, mm. why, why, why are we losing people and what can we do to keep them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the ways of thinking about it is to ask, who are we losing? Okay. Right? And you've already answered that. We are losing younger generation, but I will have to say we're also losing, it's, um, if you think of ethnicity or, or race, it's it, a lot of the nuns are coming out of white um, mm. um, folks. And here's why. Because we have the constant decline of mainline Protestantism in this country. By 2050, Mainline Protestantism will be a blip on the screen. It's breaking up and reorganizing. So it's going to be broken up into smaller denominations. Mm. Um, right now, they're losing all their cultural capital. Um, the whole 20th century is about the mainline Protestant denominations possessing all the cultural capital in this country. They did. But if you look, for example, at the current president's cabinet, there's only one mainline Protestant on it, and that's Pete Buttigieg. He's a liberal Episcopalian. So... I think a lot of the nuns are coming out of that because what you're seeing is the ongoing effect of liberalization of that sort of theological trajectory, and that's created a, a generation of folks who have thought, what's, what's left? There's nothing left. If this is just about moral action, social justice, and acting in moral ways in the community, then I don't, why do I need the church to do that? I can do that in lots of different ways, politically and things, things like that. So political organizations are on the rise, and that, I think, is uh, beginning to take the place. Now, here's what I'll say in, in response to that. Spirituality is high. Okay. Organized religion, low. Um, 
and uh, denominationalism is starting to break apart. We, we're seeing the rise of non-denominationalism. Um, if I were to tell you what I think Christianity is going to look like in 2050, I'd say it's global Pentecostal charismatic and Catholic. Um, and when I say global Pentecostal charismatic, I'm including the rise of all this non-denominationalism, many of which are charismatic. And that, that's a broad term. You could be light, you could be heavy, but it's, it's all this focus on spirituality. And I think churches that are going to be effective and catch that wave, they're going to be focused on spiritual life um, because uh, what we see is that what people are doing is trading um, Christian practices for spiritual practices. So the rise of yoga, the rise of all these other spiritual practices. Mm. Um, so I would say what we need is a comprehensive vision that gets at the spirituality, that meets people there. People want to experience the power and presence of God. They want to know that God has invested heavily in their lives. Confessionalism is not the way we're going to win people. Um, although I do think you need a robust orthodoxy, but that orthodoxy needs to be woven into a deep spirituality that meets people where they are. Um, and that to me is how we're going to recover this generation that was lost. Let's break this down. Um, explain to me when you say that the mainline churches had cultural capital that they don't have now. What does that mean in layman's terms? It means a couple of things. So we have to think about the way the U.S. functions. So okay. there's, there's the government, right? Federal government, yep. state governments, things like that. So part of cultural capital is who's occupying these elected positions and are in control of these mechanisms. Okay. okay. But there's also big business, right? So then another way of thinking about cultural capital is who's occupying um, uh, the boardrooms, in these okay. businesses, things like okay. that. Um, even Christian organizations that were created in the late 19th century, like the YMCA, who's now in charge of that? Who's over the board there? Because that's still in existence, but it's not like it was, right? So um, when I talk about mainline Protestants having cultural capital, I mean, to this day, the National Cathedral is an Episcopal church, right? So where are quote unquote religious events are happening? Chuck Colson's um, funeral was there. Um, but so was the funeral of John McCain, right? Um, that's an Episcopal church, all right? So that's cultural capital. We can see it on our screen. Mm. Where is it happening? It's happening in an Episcopal church. That's our quote-unquote national cathedral. Um, so there's a sense in which um, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, um, the United Methodists, um, all those in these, they were the ones in the boardrooms in, uh, in many of the political positions, if you look at the number of Supreme Court justices coming out of mainline Protestantism, many of them, right? And then you can tack on some from historic black churches, uh, Methodist or Baptist. But it was really the mainline Protestants. You think about the major theologians of the 20th century, Reinhold Niebuhr, right? They're mainline Protestants. Um, Paul Tillich, they're mainline Protestants. Um, so they controlled these mechanisms, I would say, um, that uh, are mediating institutions like big businesses okay, um, and um, elected officials and appointed officials like Supreme Court justices, which are not elected but appointed through a process. Um, that's what I'm thinking of when I think of cultural capital. Okay, so you're saying that the church, that there's a vacuum now from like Christianity in a lot of these positions. How do we, is, is there any way back? Well, yeah, so I'm saying a couple of things. I'm saying that mainline Protestantism did control the cultural capital. I'm also saying that from the 60s on, as mainline Protestantism started to liberalize at a, a faster pace, let's okay. say, okay, um, the children of these mainline Protestant folks, right, coming up through, mm -hmm. right, um, what, you sell, what you see is a robust confessionalism devolving into a kind of political action, moral action, and that the, the mission of the church is, is framed in terms of moral action in the community. And that moral action then becomes uh, support of particular kinds of causes. Um, now, if I'm raised in that sort of environment where um, my understanding of Christianity is, this is how we, we support these political causes, these moral, what we deem to be moral causes, social causes, that sort of thing, Eventually, I might ask the question, well, do I need to believe these things in order to do this? No, I don't. Um, it, it's led to what I 
consider to be a slow sort of moving away. Um, so I really do think that the this whole thing about the nuns and all of that, I think most of those, if you drill down the numbers, you see that it's largely white and you can see that it's largely coming from mainline. If you, if you even look at the demographics of the mainline, most of them are 80 to 90% Caucasian. Okay. They're, they're the vestiges of European Christianity in this country. Um, so, I mean, I do think that if we think about where these nuns are coming from, we can sort of see it. Now, so what do we see today? Well, we see the, the, the age of technology. So now the cultural capital is starting to be invested in um, the rise of new tech. Okay. And these people are not mainline Protestants at all. They're, they're, the, they're coming out of that, right? Um, so Google, Microsoft, Apple, all of that sort of thing, they're the ones that are beginning to hold the reign of cultural capital um, and determining kind of the future. Whereas in the past, a lot of these big businesses, um, oil companies, things like that, okay. they were... You know, there were mainline Protestants in those boardroom boardrooms making decisions and things so, like that. So, so with with this shift that's gone on, if I was going to sit into a room with you know fifteen, twenty pastors and leaders and say, mm-hmm. here's here's the world that we live in, here's what's going on in the world, here's the situation we find ourselves in, what's the answer back? Or is there in your? You know, we may go. I don't. I'm not sure at this point. But is there is there an answer that you think that in your mind, and it may be three things, five things, it may be one thing. Is there anything in your mind that you go, if the church was doing this, this would be really effective against this drift that we're seeing? Right. Okay. So let me just um, kind of broaden back and do a kind of panoramic statement. Sure. And then we'll, then we'll, okay. we'll focus in, zoom in yep. uh, to uh, what that local pastor might be might be thinking or, or might need to think and strategize about. Um So when we think about broad, kind of big picture sort Mm -hmm. of items, things like that, here's the good news. Christianity, and the reason why the church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church is because every generation, every century, I'm a historian of Christianity, here's what I've seen. Every century, God raises up Christians to renew the church, and the church continues to to be alive and vibrant. That's why there are over 2 billion Christians on the planet today, because every generation there's always renewal. Renewal is the lifeblood of the church. Um, And so we need to take comfort in that. So sometimes we get down because we look at, and this is where we need to do the big picture. We need to stop looking at, oh, this congregation closed its doors. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church universal. That doesn't mean that this congregation won't close. Congregations always close and always open. So we need to recognize that there's a vitality because the spirit is driving the church, right? So we should take heart of that, take heart. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were gonna focus in and drive that home, I would say pastors need to be thinking about ways in which um, the church is negatively perceived. What has the church done wrong to get a reputation for um, being maybe a, a political action committee more than um, uh, the church of but the, the Lord but Jesus the young Christ. the young adults in this country when they're polled they say that the church is aligned with a political organization they're, they're known more for that than right. they are a lot of so, the other stuff so here's what I would say in respect to that um, I would say to the local pastor you need to think about rebranding right what would that look like to rebrand don't hang on to terms like evangelicalism. You can be an evangelical without using the term, right? Mm -hmm. The term itself is not sacred. The term was a historical term used to describe a particular group of people who who wanted to come out of fundamentalism because they thought that fundamentalism was too narrowly focused, so they wanted to open the doors a little wider. But they were conservative Protestants, basically. Could we we critique evangelicalism today as being narrow-minded, and maybe there needs to be a renewal there to open up a little bit more? No doubt. But I would say, you know, part of that is you don't have to hold on to a term, right? And when you do, you can mix it up, right? You can mix it up. If you're, to me, you know, and that's the other, that's the other piece of advice I would say, let your theology drive your politics, don't let your politics drive your theology. And that's I was good. just having this conversation with my daughter um, who's um, doing discussions right now uh, at a summer institute and In talking- Princeton, about, right? Yes. Yep. And so, you know, I was telling her, look, Christians have come down on the left on some issues and on the right on other issues. It depends on the political context, right? Yeah. Um, so 
if you're letting your theology drive your politics, then you may land over here or land over there, right? Um, but what we're doing is letting the tail wag the dog, I would say right now, unfortunately. Okay. Um, one of the ways of getting out of that, though, is when certain movements or certain terms get branded in negative ways, we have to rebrand, I would say. And that's mm -hmm. just a very strategic thing. This is not compromise the gospel. This is not give up your theology. This is not water down your confession. This is not doing anything. This is rebrand it, repackage it, resell it. This is why you see one of the major movements going on right now is the rise of non-denominationalism. Um, network, what I call network Christianity is not unique to me. There are sociologists who talk about it. So you being a um, Pentecostal scholar, um, and, and I grew up Pentecostal, um, I'm of the opinion that a lot of what needs to be going on in our church is the power of God. Hmm. That, 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 and again, I, I don't want to sound negative here because I'm not trying to be negative. I love the church. I wouldn't even be doing this channel if I didn't love the church. But one of the things that I see missing um, are the large conversions, baptisms. I see a lot of people moving from church to church. So, so you know, I call that sort of sheep wrangling, you know. Sure. But, but there's the sense, like when I, you know, Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, I'm not coming to see your talk. I'm coming to see your power. I want to, I want to see, you know, the, the, the lifestyles that have been changed, you know, um, you know, to the Thessalonians, he says, you turn from serving idols to serving the living God, that there was a transformation. Um, don't you think that that's, because, I mean, you made the statement earlier on that you thought that in 2050, the church will look Catholic and Pentecostal charismatic, um, which I'm sure some viewers might go, oh, no, time out, that's not true, whatever. That's fine, but but I think that what you're saying is is similar to what I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking that the church that is going to reach the communities that they're in is, is going to have to have a church that has an experiential development um, part to it. You know, and, and a lot of times we're like, well, we don't wanna have the experience, we just wanna know the truth and we wanna know, but that experience is part of Christianity. That changed right. life. I mean, Paul says that, you know, um, you know, we were, we become a new creation. There's a sense that there's a change. Um, do you feel strongly and passionately that that a church that really reaches the next generation is going to have to have a, a spiritual element to it of like where conversion is happening and people are really genuinely seeing change in people's lives? Yes, yes. I mean, not just, I think it's the case demographically, okay. not just, I mean, I could make a theological case for why I think this should happen. And I should be just be clear, since you mentioned that I am Pentecostal, but that when I say spirituality, I don't mean something distinctively Pentecostal. I understand I'm not that. thinking in that way. I understand that. I'm thinking of a focus on encounter. We need to think about people encountering God. Mm -hmm. We need to help people to begin to cultivate that relationship with God. Then we need to think about people investing in the presence of God in their lives, conscious of the presence of God, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. However you want to construe that theologically, sure. sacraments can be places of encounter. They should be places of encounter. So you can be very sacramental and also think about encounter. So sure. um, I just want to, I want to- No, I understand of, that, but don't you think though that, I mean, you know, and you would know far more than me, but I mean, you know, when I studied the, you know, um, Pentecostal roots, I mean, you know, uh, um, I've read the books and you know, studied some, I mean, I'm not the historian that you are, but for me, obviously there is a Pentecostal theology and there's a Pentecostal understanding of God, but at the very nature, the, the Pentecostal start was an experience with God. Right. And, and I mean, and so when I, what I'm saying is, is we can take some of the things that people may say, hey, hey, this is Pentecostal theology. We can put that to the shelf. But the Pentecostal experience to me is is exactly what Christianity, no matter how you want to couch your theological tradition, Christianity to me starts with an experience of God. You know, it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it starts with a here's the here's the eight things that you need to believe. I think it's because you can believe a lot of things, but I think it's an experience. You know, it's the the thief on the cross had an experience. He he started off cussing and yelling at Jesus. Right. You know, and and something happened because his theology wasn't correct. He said, "Remember me when you come into your kingdom." Well, he was thinking the kingdom was future. Right. He's, he's not even right theologically on the cross. I mean, but 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 somehow, some way, he has a connection that that he wasn't baptized, didn't have the right theology, didn't know anything about confession, but there was an experience with Jesus that made him go, hold on, there's something different about you. you know. And, and I'm just saying, I, I really believe that although there are things we can do 
is churches. And I'm all for strategy and planning and stuff. But I think at the end of the day, a church that is focused on prayer and focused on in- encountering God and experiencing God and allowing people to have moments of just experiencing God, I, I think that's important if we're going to reach this next generation because I think they're crying yeah. for something. It's the lifeblood of Christianity. I mean, if you look at the whole thing, you I mean, we, we can use sophisticated terms like Christian mysticism. That's just encounter-driven Christianity by another name. You can say Protestant pietism. That's just encounter-driven Christianity by another name. You could talk about evangelical Protestantism, John Wesley, um, uh, Jonathan Edwards. That's just encounter-driven Christianity, right? The whole revivalism, all that's all. These are all various aspects of encounter-driven, but it's encounter-driven. I think what's not working as much anymore is confessional-driven Christianity. And let me explain what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about confessionalism, right, it's a historical phenomenon connected to the Reformation where, in order to get legitimacy, you wrote a confession and gave it to an emperor all, or a king, you know? I mean, there's a reason why John Calvin addresses institutes to the king of France, because he's trying to convince him that he's okay theologically. There's a reason why the Augsburg Confession is named the Augsburg Confession for Lutheranism, because it was addressed to the emperor at the imperial diet of Augsburg, right? So these confessions were written for political rulers to give political cover to Christianity. And then they became the identity markers. So Lutheran confessions became the identity markers of Lutherans and then suddenly became the identity markers of Germans. So now it becomes ethnically driven, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a whole there's a whole process is, that's moving into that. I think it's that that we have to back out of. And you need to hear what I'm saying when I say that. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a robust theology. I'm defining a particular historical n- phenomenon in which identity is connected to confessional confessions, mm-hmm. right? And I'm saying, let's have robust theology. Let's develop theology. Okay. Um, but let's think about the way in which theology and spirituality are woven together okay. into a fabric as a whole. So that, for example, the encounter with God, what it should do is open up your eyes to see God. Right? Mm-hmm. And out of that new vision of God, right, theology is born. This is what theology does. This is what theology does. The whole point of theology is to see God. Faith seeking understanding is a whole process where you're deepening your vision of who this God is, whom you have encountered. And part of the deepening of the vision is fresh encounters because you suddenly have discovered something new about this God. That's why Anselm of Canterbury, he comes up with an argument for God's existence. Where does that happen? It's in the context of saying prayers. Hmm. He's And this is, again, prayer not as petitionary, but prayer as meditation, focusing on God, praising God, engaging in deep worship of God. In that context, the argument comes. Theologically, theology naturally flows from that. So you don't, I don't want you to hear me think or hear me say we shouldn't be theolo- theological. I think we should. No, I, you're deeply theological. That Anybody who would, if they didn't know you, they might hear that. But I, I agree with that. So I don't think anybody's hearing that, but I'm glad you you said that. So let me let me point poke a little bit more. So I've got a pastor or a leader who's listening to this, and they're going, okay. So this idea of encounter, this idea of experience, a um, couple of things. Some of them may go, well, you know, we don't want it to get wild, we don't want it to get too emotional, like mm-hmm. this could be crazy. That's one camp. The other camp might be going, okay, you know what? I think that this is true. I do think that there needs to be something. So how do I then create space in a worship service for people to have encounter for people? So take on both. You got somebody who's going to go, ah, the encounter experience, it could get a little emotional. We want to keep it a little bit more clinical. We like the idea of just the sort of believe these things and we're good. We don't want to get too much emotion. Or the person who goes, no, I think I'm in, but I don't even know how to create space for encounter. Could you maybe talk to both of those? Because th- those tend to be yes. two strands of Christianity. Well, and the answer to that question really sa- is it depends on what tradition you're in okay. and how you're operating, okay. right, mm-hmm. in terms of what you... So if you're in a high sacramental tradition, for example, mm-hmm. you want to reiterate that the sacrament is a place of encounter, that when they come up for the Lord's Supper or Eucharist or Holy Communion, that they ought to be expecting 
to encounter God. Lift up your eyes, the, the liturgy says. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. In other words, let faith arise. You're encountering the Lord Jesus Christ right here in the bread and the wine. Mm. I mean, either you believe it or you don't, right? That he's here through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's classic Reformed thinking right there on Eucharist. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people just go up and go through the, the motions as though God's not really there. Oh, if he's there, he's there. I mean, so that's one way if you're in a sacramental tradition. But if you're in a non-sacramental tradition, right, mm -hmm. then you, there are different ways uh, of thinking about it. So one is at the end of a service making place, right? That's a revivalist stream. So we need to make space for encounter with God by inviting people to come forward, something like that. Or you could do some alternative. We're going to have, we have a prayer room. Or you could have prayer night. I mean, think about the way John Wimber, who, you know, helped to get the vineyard going, mm -hmm. did it, you know. It was these healing services. Even in the context of his classes at Fuller, he would teach, and at the end of it, he'd say, okay, if anybody needs to be healed, come up. We're going to lay hands on you and let God, and just see what God does. I mean, so my point is, there's not a single correct way. Here's the way, here's the basic framework. Think about the tradition that you represent or that you're trying to embody. And then think about the way in which that tradition is theologized about encounter. And then begin to strategize on how you can, how you can create the space for encounter in the context of that tradition, whether it's sacramentally, whether it's through prayer rooms, whether it's through prayer meetings, whether it's through inviting people to come to the front, whether it's through all of the above. You know, there are different mm -hmm. ways. What you're trying to do as a pastor is to build in sacred space to say, we're pausing. We're going to have an encounter with God. That's great. Yeah, that's, I, I'm, I think that that's brilliant. I hope that if you're listening, you you hear this. It's you know nobody's trying to prescribe anything to anybody, but we're trying to say that churches need a moment of pause to just be able to take a moment to say, hey, let's give God a chance to move in our lives and encounter. Um, I think that's so important because I think sometimes in the American church we're so focused on just getting our stuff done, the announcements, the sermon, the music. In, in, in getting people out so we can get the next service in. A lot of times we just have lost space for God and in losing space for God, we've almost lost our soul because that is what keeps things going. Another question for you. As a church historian, what can we learn or what should we be learning right now from church history where we're at right now as a church? And because one of the things I've loved about church history is it kept me from a load of bad things that get, you know, as a Christian, you sort of get, hey, yeah, maybe this is what's going, but then you read church history and go, no, that's not the trail you want to go down. That's a bad trail. Stop right, it. Right, right. Are, are there any things, you know, in, in the world that we live in today? I mean, obviously the church has become super political. It's become super divided. Yes. Um, it's, 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 it's losing people. There's a number of things going on. Anything from church history that you could think about that you go, we, we need to learn some of this stuff to be able to deal with some of the issues we're dealing with. Sure. I mean, there's some, there's some big items, and then there's some more subtle things that okay. I think uh, we can we can think about. So th some of the big items are things like, um, you know, one of the biggest mistakes was the wedding together of um, colonialism and missions, which is what exactly what happened um, at the turn of the 1500s, the turn of the Reformation, when the Pope authorized Portugal and Spain as political entities to begin to to spread the gospel. So that their conquest of central of the Caribbean, Central and South America went hand in hand with the spread of the gospel. And then there were debates over whether they should co coerce people to be Christian. There were actual debates in Spain, in the University of Salamanca, over whether they should do that for the sake of saving their souls, right? I mean, if your soul, if their soul is at stake, we need to compel these people to be Christian in some way. And then you start to use political power to compel to bring revival. Okay. Right? So that's Number one, we can't make that mistake again. And that's where we have to be really careful about politics as the mechanism of renewal. No. The church is the mechanism of renewal. The church is its own politics. If I want to use Stanley Hauerbos, right? It's a good yeah. Anabaptist line, right? The yeah. church is its own polis. So stop using the political apparatus of the day to try to facilitate renewal. No, let the church do it through its own mechanisms. Um, that's a danger that we need to avoid, number one. Um, Number two, I would say in this country, of course, we need to recognize, you know, the way in which the church has failed on issues of race hmm. and been caught up and been complicit in many ways, right? I don't think people realize how harsh Jim Crow actually was sometimes. I mean, they don't understand. Yeah, people talk about lynching and things of that nature, but it was, I mean, 
We had these laws that defined what blackness was. We had all these one drop rules that said if you have one drop of blood, as it were, that is to say you have a grandfather or a great grandfather in one line, you were defined as black. You could look just like you're a white person, but you were defined that way legally and excluded from marriage, excluded from you know these sorts of things. And there were Christians that bought into that. We bought into curse of ham kind of theology, mm-hmm. right? So bad theology in the service of these horrible cultural agendas that actually ha- are still with us in the way, uh, in, in terms of questions like, is Christianity a white man's religion? That's a live question in the black community that we don't even know sometimes. But that live question is re- directly related to the history in this country. So I think we need to deal with our history um, if wherever we are and maybe repent, maybe you know work you know, to overcome that history. I mean, that's another lesson. What do you do with the Christians though that are like, man, you know, there's, there's no racism in America. You know, it's, it's all great. You know, everybody, the, the liberal media is just stirring this up. And acting like it's you know something or whatever, how do you how do you counter that? What do you say? So I would just simply you know the first thing you'd want to ask is um, is there a divide or is there not a divide? Where are we meeting on Sunday morning? How many churches are doing the multicultural thing? And how difficult is it to do multicultural thing to bring people together? Right. I mean, there's a comedian right now. His name's John Christ. Probably right. Heard of right, John Christ. Right. John Christ frequently in his stand up routine finds somebody in the congregation and he asks the question. Do you go to church? And they say yes. And he goes, Do you go to a white church or a black church? And they and they say, Oh, we go to a church that's integrated. He goes, There's no such thing. You either go to a white church or a black church. Whether he's right or wrong or indifferent, I think that there is there's something he's saying there that that is like I'm as a pastor, I'm listening to that and I'm going, okay, th- there's something real here because right. he he perceives that you're either white or you're black in your Christian experience. And there is no togetherness, right? And 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 I and I think that that my personal experience is, is that that shouldn't be the case. I always say the local church should look like heaven, you know. Right. And, and and I want our church. I mean, I want Grace Community Church to look like heaven, and I think everybody knows that. But there are, you know, um, again, I think there's people on both extremities that 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 push the issue too far on one side and too far on the other. There's no such thing as racism and everything is racist. I mean, right, I, think there's, right. I think there are extremes, but I think as a Christian, I have to be aware that there are these issues. Um, well, there talking. are, and we, mean, we, we speak the same language, but we speak a different dialect. And so we don't understand each other. I had a friend who interviewed at a prominent uh, evangelical seminary, African-American friend, mm-hmm. um, considered himself an evangelical. They told him you're not evangelical because he he couldn't translate his conservatism into evangelical speak in a way that they thought, okay, you're one of us. They just could not, they couldn't understand it, what he was saying. He he was speaking English. He wasn't speaking a foreign language. He was talking Jesus. But they kept hearing social justice, liberal, da-da-da-da, and it didn't matter. And, and that's not the first. I had a, a friend who was an um, immigrant from uh, Latin America. Um, I remember him in an office exasperated saying to me, I'm an evangelical, I'm an evangelical, I'm an evangelical. Why don't they see that? And that, my response was, because you pitch it in a different way, and they can't understand the pitch. They just can't hear it. They're tone deaf to it. So when you pitch it, they hear liberal. So what do we do? Because, I mean, we're, we're divided right now. I mean, this pandemic... Yeah. Um, uh, election, masks. I mean, man, it just, I mean, it just, yes. I mean, yes. came through the church in a wave. What do we do? How do we, how do we remedy this? I mean, is there anything in church history you go back to and go, you know, cause you're great at like calling off some crazy, you know, time in church. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with all the stuff you know about well, church history. Is there anything you can pull from? Here's and go, what I would say. Help us. First of all, first and foremost, and this is the subtle point that I wanted to make that we okay. we live with, but we don't realize that we live with it. And that is, I'm just going to put it this way in stark terms to sort of arrest people. There's no pure Christianity, people. None. Ever. It's all syncretized in some way, shape, or form. So what do I mean when I say that? It's all mixed. And people are different levels in their discipleship. Um, And so if you're judging people from this state of doctrinal purity and then you're defining doctrinal purity 
in light of your confessional tradition and you're applying that definition to that person that's in front of you, you will never hear him or her speak in a way that makes sense to you. Um, I'll give you some examples of this. You know, um, there's a great Japanese Catholic writer, um, Shushaku Indu. He wrote a novel called Silence, and it was about um, Japanese Christians who were left in the country after the emperor and shoguns decided that they were going to rid the country of Christianity in the 1600s. You know, um, Jesuits came in in the 1500s, and they started to evangelize Japan. Franciscans came in. They started to have some success. There was a peasant revolt. Um, things like that were happening. The emperor, they made the call, we're going to rid this country. We're going to do se severe persecution. Um, and so they did. They wiped out. They rid it of priests. They were um, putting people to death. They were forcing people to step on an image of Christ as a way of getting them to apostate, all these sorts of things. And yet it survived. Did it survive in some pure doctrinal form? No, it did not. It survived in a syncretized form, a mixture of, of Christianity with Japanese culture and, and uh, religion and things like that, and yet they were still there. And one of the questions that um, Endo asks at the end of his novel is, what does it mean to be Christian? How do we understand? Can we call these people Christian? Um, now, let me, let me sharpen that for just a second here. I remember uh, a question that was asked to me at seminary. I went to Reformed Theological Seminary. One of my professors, a guy named Richard Pratt, was a great Old Testament yeah, guy. I know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, he said, he just pressed us one day. He just said, what do you have to do to be a Christian? Do you have to know the Trinity? Come on. Are you telling me you got to have your Trinity doc doctrinally correct to be a Christian? What about two natures of Christ? You have to have that down, divine, divine and human. How do you have to have that down? I mean, what doctrine is absolutely 100% fundamentally required for you to be in a living relationship with Jesus? I mean, he just kept pushing, 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 and it forced us to sort of rethink, rethink, rethink. And it helped me, I think, pastorally to begin to say, okay, if a little child can be a follower of Jesus, and that child have no sophisticated theology whatsoever, she just believes Jesus is her Savior. She's not even sure what that term Savior means. And yet God meets that child where he or she is. Are we going to say that God doesn't meet the Japanese Christians struggling to live in accordance with Christianity when all Bibles have been jettisoned? All they have are, are, are icons of the cross or something like that, and they're trying to pray their prayers, and they're, they don't have a clear conception. Um, what are we going to say about those folks? Now, if we can think that, begin to think that way, then we can begin to live in the messiness of Christianity, and it is messy. It's totally messy. I, 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 I'm. It, it, there's a. I, I forget who the guy was. You'll appreciate this. It was a sermon that he preached, and it was on the thief on the cross. And the thief on the cross shows up to heaven, and they say, um, "Why are you here?" He says, um, "They're like, did you get baptized?" No. Um, do you know anything about the Trinity? No. Did you um, go to church? No. Um, can we call in a supervisor here? Because we don't know why this guy's here. <laughs> right, we don't right. know why he's here. Um, so did you ever um, read scripture? No. Did you ever attend any religious service? No. Sir, why are you here? I'm here because of the man in the middle. Right. I'm here because of the man in the middle. You know, and, and I think that, you know, I, I have often said, I mean, I say this all the time. I mean, you know, I think Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says it best. If Jesus didn't get up from the grave, then it's all over. I think when somebody goes, I believe Jesus got up from the grave, because I think that that is an important part. I mean, I, I don't know how you could really believe Jesus is your Savior. Now, you may not understand fully what all that means. You may not right. understand all the implications of that. You may not understand what it means to be, have a holy Saturday or a good Friday or any of that stuff. But, but somehow you believe, you know, I, I think of like the early Jewish Christians, you know, walking around going, man, did you hear about the guy in Jerusalem? Yeah, was he hung on the cross? Yeah, dude, he got up from the grave, man. Are you in? Right. Okay, and, and, it was, and I'm in. You know, and it's like, so, it, you know, but what we do is we complicate it with how you vote, how you view sanctification, how you view baptism, 
what you think about, you know, is the hypostatic union, is it 100%, 100%, is it 80-20, is it whatever, you know, all this stuff. How does that work? Um, you know, eschatology, do you believe in a rapture, not well, a rapture? And, and then yes. everything becomes funneled through that, and it's all these check marks. And, and my, my concern as a pastor is that I know a lot of people who have check marks, but I wonder if they even have a relationship with God. Right. You know, and to me, that, I mean, Jesus says, I didn't know you. Okay, there's some sense of like, there's a relational, you know, and it's not, it's not that everything is perfect. I mean, I'm not saying sound doctrine's not important and neither are you. Exactly. And I teach theology, so obviously I love theology, but, I, but I've also learned in my life, and you knew me as a young guy, you knew how radical I was. Um, I've learned over time that, Chip, there's just a very few amount of things that I'm gonna hold in this closed hand that define what it means for somebody to truly be a follower of Jesus. Right. I used to have this castle of stuff and nobody could get through it without, you know, because they had to jump through all these hoops. But this is so important because everybody, I mean, not everybody's a strong term, but many people in the church have all these checklists that you gotta go through. And if you're not this stuff, you're not in. Right. And, 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 and we've divided over all this stuff. There's Christians that have divided. If you wear a mask, you're not a Christian because a Christian wouldn't wear a mask, or vice versa. If you don't wear a mask, you don't love your brother, so you couldn't be a I mean, it's like, seriously, we, we've got to the place where, th like, this. how do we get rid of this judgmentalism, this this garbage that we're dealing with right now? Yeah, well, you're, you're right. I mean, I think it's an extension of this historical phenomenon of confessionalism, where the confession just keeps getting extended, extended to involve particular issues of science and these sorts of things. And that's where it enters into the political arena, I think, through this extension of confessional identity. So it's connecting your identity to the confession okay. and then extending the nature of the confession into all these other realms, right, of uh, what you could call non-essentials. And you're, you're absolutely right, I would say, that of course there are some minimal things that people have to hold on to. But then, the, but then you can ask the question, what do they have to ha hold about those minimal things? Like you said, Jesus rose from the dead. Do you have to, what do you have to understand about that? Right? How deep do you have to? Does your understanding of that have to go? It doesn't have to go that deep if the child can do, can understand it, sure. and embrace it. Right? I mean, so, so I would say we have to first of all recognize that we're all in the fuzzy mess stage, <laughs> and we're all moving toward clarity. Faith seeking understanding is a movement toward clarity. So of course we should be moving toward clarity, but we're all moving, and people are at different phases of that, and so we should just relax a little bit allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives and try to understand where they are and understand them on their own terms. One of the exercise I always tell my students, one of the things in my classes I tell them, look, you need to understand that writer on their own terms. I'm not expecting you to agree with everyone you read, you won't, but I am expecting you to understand them on their, their terms, not yours, theirs. Enter into their thought, try to figure it out because love requires that of you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and know that they're a brother or a sister in Christ, because you know I'm doing historical theology, church history, so we're usually reading Christians, yeah. right? So know that they are. They're struggling to try to do this. You won't agree with everything, but that's okay. Just see where they are. Um, and so, I mean, I would say that we have to do that. As pastors, we have to do that. It's uncomfortable. We don't like it. We want people to be better than they are, right? right. We want them to be more moral than they tend to be. We want them to hold clear, clear doctrinal statements than they tend to, they tend to hold. But my investigation of history of Christianity, particularly at the lay level, is that most lay people, I don't care what tradition you're in, most lay people don't have a great handle on all these things, right? They're just in that fuzzy mess stage. Are there, are there some that are more advanced than mm -hmm. others? You bet. Mm -hmm. But they're all there. And so... Try to meet people where they are. Try to have a conversation. Try to understand mm -hmm. them where they are. I always I say to, I say to pastors when I'm teaching homiletics classes, I always say, you may think that the person out there wants to hear a Greek verb parsed. You may think that they want to understand, you know, this nice, incredible exegesis of a Johannine epistle. What they want to know is, is how do I keep my daughter from going out of the window on Friday night? to go have sex with her boyfriend. Yes. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 like the concern of the average person in church is not the concern that so many of us bring right. to the table. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, do you do you understand the, you know, Westminster catechism? Like most people are like, well, I don't care about that. I need to know how do I keep my son from smoking pot? Right. Like how does Christ intersect that? Well, and here's you know? the other thing, you know, one of the one of the 
major challenges for me when I taught 18 to 21 year olds, undergrads, is this. Convincing them that the version of Christianity they grew up with, that they're rejecting, is not Christianity as a whole. Because they had equate, here's the way I'll put it. There's the great river of Christian tradition, Protestant, Orthodox, Catholic, great river. And then there are these tributaries that flow off the river. Mm. We confuse the tributary with the river. And I had kids coming into my classes. They thought rejecting the tributary meant rejecting the river. And I said, nope, let's let's go, let's swim back upstream and get into that river. And what you're going to see is that the waters are deep. And there's places for you there in the river, as long as you don't equate the tributary with the river. This is great. This is this is golden. This is this is the issue. There's so many young kids that are walking away from the faith. It exactly what you're saying. They've equated Christianity with a tributary. That's that. That's. It, please hear this. If you're a leader or a pastor, this is so important to get. The tributary is not. The tradition it's the it's the river and and like you said the river is incredibly deep and i wish there's so many young people that go to college go to university and they just abandon everything because they've equated a particular thing right with the whole tradition that is that is of everything we've said right now that's probably the most golden mm-hmm. golden thing how do you talk to a pastor a leader a christian right now help them to understand that the tributary is not the fullness of Christianity. Like, because some person may be going, oh, but you don't understand, man. I got to hold on to these nine things because this is right, what it right, means. Right, 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 um, right. Help somebody to under, maybe, because this might, if so, if one person who hears this podcast video cast unwinds mm-hmm. from the tributary is the tradition, right. it, then then we've, I've succeeded in what I want to do. How, how, can, how can you help somebody unwind from that? So there are a couple of ways that you can begin to do that. First of all, you need to make friends ecumenically. <laughs> and that's a mission That's a mission strategy anyway. I, I always tell my students, no single church or denomination can take a city. You want to take a city, you got to partner with all people, in, all the Christians across denominations to take the city. That's great. Right? You can't fill up a single church with everybody. There are what, 500,000 people in Sarasota County? You can't fill up a single church with 500,000 people, mm-hmm. but the church is coming together. So you need to learn to speak everybody's language. So step out of your... So one of the ways of swimming back up the tributary is to step over and have a conversation with a fellow minister who's not in your tradition, having conversations Mm. that way. Um, Second way of doing it, I'd say, is you got to start reading broadly. Read outside. Mm. And yes, I grew up Pentecostal. Yes, I'm still Pentecostal. But I went to Reformed Theological Seminary and studied Reformed theology pretty deeply. I went to Oxford after that, studied Catholic theology. I'm a medievalist by training, went deep in the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. All of that just broadened and deepened my faith, helped me to see things more clearly. And it really relaxed me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm just not uptight about these things anymore. Um, so I would say you got to read outside of your tradition, read broadly and deeply in Christianity as a whole. You already really do that as a matter of practice when it comes to pastoral strategies. Um, as a pastor. Generally speaking, there's this sort of uh, ecumenical kind of cooperation when it comes to how do we reach the city? What are the, what are these leadership principles that we're supposed to be um, taking, you know, taking in, things like that. So we'll read all these people on these leadership principles. Well, just, just apply that to your theology. Read all these different people. Again, you don't have to agree, but it actually begins to help you to find the essentials and deepen the essentials when you do that. And I think that will give you a, well, I'll just put it this way. Um, Look, I tell students to increase your vocabulary because it increases your capacity to think. And increasing your capacity to think, it increases your imagination. Mm. And your creativity is directly linked to your imagination. The more you expand your, and it's not only that, let me just talk for a moment to the Pentecostal charismatic folks. I just tell them, look, when God speaks prophetically, it's always through the, the imagination. The more you expand your imagination, you expand your horizon, the more you expand your openness to God speaking to you in ways that are relevant and fresh and those sorts of things, right? How do we expand our imagination? We have to deepen our vocabulary. We have to deepen our understanding of Christianity as a whole. And that means we have to read outside of our tradition. Um, we'll encounter the same terms, but we'll encounter them in ways that are unfamiliar to us. And that's great. That's wonderful. You know, it'll be like 
um, someone from the Midwest encountering a deep Mississippian for the first time and he, trying to figure out, okay, we're speaking the same language, but I'm not quite tracking with that dialect. I need to I need to pay more closely attention, pay closer attention mm. to it. I need to figure out how you're using these terms because they're not familiar to me. I mean, so in that second way, so again ecumenical relationships, cooperation, but then stepping out of your tradition and reading deeply mm. and knowing that that won't be a denial of your tradition to do that. It'll actually deepen and broaden it because it'll help you to see the way in which your tributary flows out of the Great River um, and what's distinctive to it and what's not distinctive to it. So those would be my okay. you know, recommendations. To a pastor or a leader right now that is... Um listening to this, watching this, and they, uh, they're they just really, they're distraught. Mm. Pandemics hurt their church. Mm. Um, people have left, finances are down. Um, maybe they jumped on this to just maybe find some sort of hope, some sort of connection. My gosh, can I find anything? Right. Um, what would you say to that person? Wow, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Yeah. I mean, um, I didn't bring you on here to just give you softballs, man. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to push you, man, a little bit. You know, yeah. enlarge that vocabulary, yes. broaden that imagination. You well, know, I'm thinking in a lot of ways, but I mean, one of the one of the things that immediately comes to my mind is the fact that the average church in America is still a small church. That's right. And I think we need to. Yes, there are mega churches, and those churches tend to be centered in urban in context because that's where, and they tend to be centered in certain geographical regions. There are a lot more in the south, southeast, southwest. Mm. Um, it's harder to do a mega church in the north, um, and it's harder in urban contexts in the north. One of the reasons why Tim Keller goes to New York City to to build a church, right? Um, so, I mean, if you're telling me the average pastor out there, I'm thinking the, a guy who's pastoring a church under absolutely, would, and, and I am too. Or, I'm not or, thinking, or, or a woman, right? Because yeah, so, um, there are women pastors absolutely. out there, right? Yes. Or some of them, if they're Methodist, they may be pastoring more than one church, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's there. I mean, so I would say um, to that person several things. Number one, um, be faithful and know that success is defined in terms of faithfulness. That's great. Okay. I mean, and that should be just a standard principle in which you apply it, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to be faithful. Um, and remember this early Christianity grew out of house churches because these people were just being faithful. You don't have a mega church in early Christianity. Our first quote unquote mega churches. I guess would be the cathedrals that Constantine decides to build after he becomes emperor, right? That's 325 or 300 years into the project. That's exactly right. So be faithful where you are. Sec secondly, know that the, the small steps of faithfulness that you are giving are part of a larger plan, a larger purpose. That is to say, God has the capacity of taking what little you're doing and bringing it up into this larger realm. That's great. Right? Yes. National revival starts in multiple centers. We never talk about a great awakening as starting in a single location. It's multiple locations that suddenly sync up, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them are small and some of them are big, but mm -hmm. they're all, but they start to sync, right? So know that you are one of those outposts. And you, if you're faithful where you are, the little things that you're doing, sowing into the lives of the people that do come your way, um, that faithfulness will bear fruit. And it, you may not see it entirely in mm. your lifetime, but it will bear fruit. And you will one day stand before the Lord, and part of the vision you'll see is the fruit that it will bear, and it will so overwhelm you that you will fall down and say, thank mm. you, Jesus. Mm. You used me in ways that I don't even see. I didn't even recognize That's at right. the time, but I see it now. I see it how all these people were touched. That's right. Or I see it how I touched that that child who went on to do X, Y, and Z, and I never saw what that child did, but it was because I said this, I did that. So be faithful and know that your faithfulness will be taken up into something something greater, right? I mean, so those would be the two basic approaches. Now, within that, then you can talk about all kinds of strategies, yeah, right? But I think those. I think what you just did there is you gave people hope. You told me a story last night at dinner about your father-in-law praying for a baby. Right. And, and you use the word perfunctory prayer. Right. Tell that story again, because, because it really taps into the fact that when we're faithful and we just do the things that we know that we should do, you know, because so often in America, it's driven by success and 
did you get the supersized mill? Did you get, you know, right. and, and, you know, and people go, oh, well, you know, Grace Community Church grew, so they must be successful. And it, that's just, it's just, that's just not the case. Noah was very faithful and Noah didn't have a mega church. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. So, so we, we've got to rebrand that. But tell that story because I just feel like somebody who's listening, it, it just, it's just, it's just ministry. It's just normal, but it shows how God does the supernatural in the natural that he does the extraordinary in the ordinary. And sometimes right. we need to hear this story. Right. Yeah, so my father-in-law, 40-plus um, year missionary to Nicaragua, east coast of Nicaragua, a um, place called Blue Fields, uh, English-speaking on the east coast, um, sort of part of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he's 13 churches came out of this ministry, independent Pentecostal churches. But one one time he was building a church. It was on an island because they had some islands off the coast, building a church. Um, and he's just, you know, he's, he's dirty. He's getting his hands dirty for God, putting the, the bricks together, that sort of thing. And then somebody comes over and says to him, you know, we need you to come pray for this baby. Um, something going on. We need to pray. So he drops what he's doing, walks into this house, and he sees these women. They're dressed in a particular way. They're They're crying. Um, and then he sees the baby uh, laying there, and he goes, he picks up the baby, he prays a prayer for God to touch and heal this baby, puts the baby down, you know, greets them, walks out, goes back, keeps building the church, right? That's it. So later he finds out the baby is recovered. Um, what he didn't know then um, was that what he had stumbled into was mourning because that baby had died. Or it breathed its last breath, and they had wrapped this baby in special clothes, he, special cloths. He didn't recognize it, right? He's not Nicaraguan, right? He's an American down there. He didn't recognize what was going on. He didn't understand the cultural cues, and this is a, this is a time of mourning. All he knew was he was asked to go pray. He went in, he walked in, prayed the prayer, walked out, and just kept, kept working for God. Um, and then he's told this baby is alive. Well, this is a miracle story. <laughs> right? That is that is was even told at his funeral two years ago, right? You know, he died when he was 92. Um, by Nicaraguans who to this day, because this child is alive, grew up, is adult, is mm. functioning, all that, who remember, you know, his my wife's last name or maiden name is Wine. Um, they call him Mr. Brother Wine, Mr. Brother Wine walking in and doing this. Um, but it's something that he was not aware of at the time at all. All he was doing was being faithful trying to pray a prayer because they had asked him to. He wasn't calling lightning down from heaven. He wasn't asking, you know, he wasn't whipping anything up. He wasn't getting emotional. It was really in the heat of the day, a man who was tired doing what he was supposed to do in his mind. Absolutely. And listen, if you're listening, that's really, if I could say anything to you at all, that's what we do. We just, we do the things that God has called us to do and and we be, and we're faithful in those things and you just never know how many children are raised from the dead both physically and literally um, and spiritually in our lives um, and so I hope that hope that helps some Dale you've been awesome thanks for for joining us uh, we'll we'll do this again at some other point I'm sure um, but it's been a blessing to have you on here and uh, again please subscribe um, you know go to our Facebook page Instagram uh, reaching the next generation we really want to help resource you as a pastor or a leader to be able to effectively reach the next generation. Thanks so much for uh, being a part today. Hey, Chip here. I just wanna take a moment and say thanks so much for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians, and you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.